you've reached the Signal Watch. Movies, television, comics, and more. I'm your host, Ryan Steens. Join me and our cadre of co-contributors as we examine cultural artifacts of the 20th century, boldly explore the 21st, and try to put it all in perspective. Stay tuned. We're going to try to make this work. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to The Signal Watch. As always, I'm your host, Brian Steens. And with me on this terrifying day of horror (laughs) is Justin Lincoln. Hello. Hey, man. Welcome back. Thanks. Um, It's been a while. Yeah, it has. Uh, I was delighted when you pitched doing what will be this like little mini series we're going to do, because I feel like not from when I first met you. Well, from when I first, we first started hanging out when we were like 14 years old. Right. We, you were like, you got to watch this horror movie. You got to watch that horror movie. And then I moved away. And then we, so Justin and I had known each other when we were like in like elementary school through like ninth grade. And then I moved away. And then in college, I didn't expect to ever really see Justin again. And I walked off the elevator of my new dorm and there's Justin standing in the hallway. And I was like, oh, my God. And and I knew uh, Michael, his roommate, because Michael had hung out with us as well. Mm-hmm. And almost immediately, we started talking about Army of Darkness. I think it was maybe 20 minutes of hanging out and catching up before Army of Darkness came up. That Yeah, that tracks. That sounds about right. Because I, I definitely remember Michael and Micah and I all working at the movie theater and Army of Darkness coming out. And it was kind of at that time where I think unless you subscribed to maybe Fangoria or something like that, you didn't, I mean, now it's impossible not to know a movie's being made. Right. But I feel like when we got the trailer for that, our jaws just absolutely hit the floor because Evil Dead 2, which we'll get to next, is I think such a... um, seminal movie so minus your influence i was not a huge horror guy uh in high school um i just wasn't all that interested and and so i remember my brother had seen evil dead 2 somewhere along the way but not with me and we were at the theater and the trailer for army of darkness came on and he just goes no way like out loud and I'm just looking at him like, what is this? And he's like, it's the sequel to Evil Dead 2. And I was like, this is the sequel to Evil Dead 2. <laughs> and somehow I still never watched it. I didn't see Evil. We'll talk about my journey to Evil Dead 2 because uh, I saw the movies in reverse order, um, which took me to not seeing Evil Dead until I think my second year of college. Okay. I think it was when I finally what? watched this one. And it's such a. I mean, two in Army of Darkness definitely work as a movie and its sequel. Whereas I've always felt like Evil Dead 2 is just kind of a parody of Evil Dead 1. Yeah. Done by the same, same film. film. <laughs> and it's it almost, fun yes. Time. Yeah. And, and it almost feels to me like you can feel it becoming Evil Dead 2 in the third act of this movie. Yeah. Um, so what are we talking about? We're talking about Evil Dead. We're going to talk about all three of the Evil Dead movies. I have no doubt it's going to be one long conversation. We should probably have just stitched together. Um, but I, I was really excited to get a chance to talk about it because I, I think that Evil Dead, the first one, holds this really unique place in independent cinema. 
Evil Dead 2 holds a completely different but equally important place in indie cinema. And then Army of Darkness holds a play, completely different place in mainstream cinema, um, but it's become its own a cult classic in its own right. Yeah. Um, and this one um, can't, comes out in 1981. I don't think I'd ever heard of it. I, I know I'd seen the art on the box, like walking around the video store. It was called Evil Dead. The name didn't mean anything to me. Um, I'd see it with Evil Dead 2 on the shelf. But during this era, you'd see like Pumpkin Master 1. Pumpkin Ma- I'm just making up a name. I'm sure there was not a Pumpkin Master. <laughs> but <laughs> There should be. Well, there is now. I would say, I think we're making Pumpkin Master now. <laughs> Um, but you'd see Brian like James all these... is the pumpkin master. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I yeah. Now I'm going to be thinking of what the plot of the pumpkin master could <laughs> potentially be all night long. Um, but you'd you'd see these sequels, and it didn't mean I never checked anything out. I, I would occasionally like, oh, Nightbreed that is horror adjacent. Um, you know, I'll, I'll watch that, but I wasn't going to go into like, see what was going on with ghoulies for or whatever. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. And then my brother had seen evil dead too. And, and he, he had mentioned it and he said, Oh, it's, it's actually, it's really gross, but it's really funny. You should watch it. And I was like, I don't really know what you're talking about. I'm not interested. Um, and then certainly evil dead one was, was its own thing. But what, when did you surely, what order did you watch these in? Like what? So I feel like it was too. um, Maybe one and then army of darkness. But I, I mean, I may have actually seen this one last, which seems weirdly plausible. Mm Mm-hmm. I know that um, I know I'd seen two quite a while back um, because I remember in having to write a paper in Miss Fort's class, which would have been ninth grade English okay, for yes. us. Pour and, one out for Miss Fort, who is no longer yeah, with us. I know. I saw that um, in referencing Sam Raimi. In something I had to write and feeling really smart about myself doing that. And I can't think of what of his I would have seen other than Dark Man and mm. Evil Dead 2. Right, right, right. And I feel like I was probably thinking about Evil Dead 2 more. But yeah, I, I feel like I didn't see this one till later and was, I guess, kind of surprised that it was played a lot more as a kind of straightforward horror film. I mean, clever and stylish, but even to this day, I still find this movie kind of scary. Mm -hmm. I mean, when the, I think the creature in the basement and the makeup is really good. (laughs) So this hadn't happened to me in a while. I was watching this while I was eating lunch (laughs) <laughs> and that scene happened with her in the basement, like and her face was like all gloopy. And I just put my sandwich down. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, my appetite is 100% gone right now. <laughs> yeah. There's so much. I mean, I, in, I don't, I don't know if we're jumping ahead too much, but I was rewatching it again last night and I was trying to take some other notes and I was reading that this film got kind of embroiled in, I guess, the British video nasties, which I'm not sure if you would, Simon, have maybe talked about. No, we've never talked about it. It'd be well worth bringing up. But I never really, I always thought of those movies being a little more um, mean rather than just straight up gory. Because I don't find, I find this, well, everyone finds this movie very gory because it is, Wall to wall gore, but I think Raimi is really smart in that he never makes it like mean gore. Like people are getting 
yeah. chopped up, but it's not, um, there's no, you know, maniac doing it out of bloodlust or anything like this. Yeah. Which I really right. appreciate because yeah. I've, I've, I, I mean, I love horror movies, but I don't really like, um, mean horror movies. No, I, I think I think we're very much on the same page. I, I have no interest in. I mean, take it to the extreme example: a human caterpillar. Um, it's human centipede, sir. Sorry. Yes, human centipede. <laughs> sorry. Okay, human pumpkin caterpillar. Now human there's caterpillar. a caterpillar. Yeah, <laughs> we're just we're just popping ideas here tonight. Um, and then we'll get to pumpkin master versus human caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> He turns into a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so just to, to recap, if you've never seen the movie, here's our South Coast Media uh, film recap. Um, South Coast Media for all your media needs here in the South Coast. Um, a group of five people, two couples, and I believe Ash's sister, Am I right? Is Cheryl his sister? I, I, th- I think so. I get so caught up in the movie that I forget who everybody is. Um, they, they, they're for some reason going, well, I know why logistically why they're going to Tennessee, uh, but they go from uh, Michigan state university to Tennessee, to a cabin in the woods. Like there's no cabins in the woods in Michigan um, for a, a, we get away where they're clearly going to have shenanigans and, and have a good time, you know, away from the prying eyes of, of everybody else. Uh, they go into the basement and find a tape recorder that um, is the, the voice tran- voice notes of a uh, archeologist uh, talking about how he has found this um, Sumerian book of the dead. And, um, whoops, I accidentally read an, a, a spell and now my wife is possessed by demons. Um, and that's what you need to know, you know? And so um, they, they play, play the tape and they hear him actually reading the incantation and demons who you never really see up here um, and wreak havoc upon our cabin dwellers. And it's a small cast um filmed basically in one location um and the the making of the film is its own kind of epic journey and story uh which we might get into here a little bit um but yeah it was just basically a bunch of ideas that some college friends or college aged friends uh came up with and decided to kind of stitch together and they just through kind of force of will and begging a lot of people for cash ended up making a movie that made everyone involved a whole lot of money on the other side. Yeah. Did yeah. you, have you, have you ever read much about the production of evil dead? A little bit. So I, I was reading trivia and things like that last night. So I did read some and I read in, I haven't looked at the credits to see if that's true, that the voice on the tape recorder is Bob Dorian. Who is former Turner classic movies? I think he did. I don't know if he did intros or voiceovers. Okay, he probably did voiceovers. This is always um, the other guy who was did all the intros when they first started. Wait, there was another guy who was on yeah. there a long time ago. Okay, interesting. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it. Um, I, I read the If Chins Could Kill book, I don't know, like five years ago. So my memory is a little hazy at this point. But yeah, they, I mean, Bruce Campbell, who plays Ash, was is childhood friends essentially with Sam Raimi and Ted Raimi and, and Robert, Robert Tappert, yeah. um, the producer of the film. And they basically all were like pals making eight millimeter films back in the day. Um, I don't really know where the idea for evil dead came from, but, um, they'd been doing a bunch of other things. And I guess Ramey enjoyed 
doing the horror bits that they were doing so much. He's got really focused on that as, as a thing they could do. Um, and apparently also just be, they were huge three stooges fans. So they like to do like lots of visual gags and stunts, things like that. And, um, he, Ramey also really liked beating up Bruce Campbell. Um, I mean, just famously. So, and <laughs> That if you watch Evil Dead 2 in particular, like we'll get yeah. into it. But um, poor Ted Raimi sure gets it quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone he loves, he seems to want to um, put through the ringer on film. Yeah. Not necessarily in real <laughs> life, but certainly on film. Indeed. So what what is your um, what draws you to Evil Dead in particular? Uh, oh, good question. Um, I do like that it that I find it frightening, which you know, not that I don't get scared easily, but I really like when a movie can scare me. Like I don't mind not feeling comfortable, you know, walking through the dark house after seeing a spooky movie because I'm still spooked out by it. So I really like that. Um, I mean, the sheer amount of just over-the-top gore is a lot of fun here. And like Mm -hmm. I say, because it's, you can, I mean, they must have had a riot on this set. I've never read, I mean, I've read that, I guess the shooting conditions weren't great and it was very cold and things like this, but you can only imagine how much fun it would be be to you know come up with the idea of okay these creatures are going to shoot milk out (laughs) you know as just as much milk as blood and it's so it's i think it's very creative it's very spooky um and i don't know i it's sincere i think it's sincere filmmaking you don't get the impression that I mean, I'm sure nobody really does a movie without the hope, makes a movie without the hope that turns into something else for them. But this never feels, it doesn't feel like a giant demo reel. It feels like these guys made a movie, which which maybe the whole demo reel thing is a little more today and first, first features where it seems like, a lot of first features are kind of aping your inspirations. This feel, right. I mean, this feels like Sam Raimi out of the gate. Like there's, and I mean, clearly you can see, especially when we get into part two, you'll see the three stooges and things like that, but it's not like we're going to make our three stooges movie. You know, it, it's, you can definitely, there's a real, there's a real voice in, in, in this movie that, yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely shocking how much of what I think of as being Sam Raimi-isms are in this thing. Um, I will say, uh, just kind of as an historical note, they did shoot a short that was basically a version of Evil Dead. I've never seen it. Um, there's This is when we can get into kind of some of the like interesting bits of where this kind of sits in the indie world. Um, and that was what they went around and showed to, uh, p- potential investors for the movie. It was a bunch of dentists or something like this. Didn't he, didn't he? End yeah. Up- yeah. I, I think that's what I remember Bruce Campbell saying was like, yeah, it was a, like a group of dentists invested. Um, so interesting bit, they do this and then of course shoot the movie, edit it. And who's working as the assistant editor on the film, (laughs) but Joel Cohen, I believe it was Joel. Um, And he's like, oh, so you made a trailer essentially for the movie you're going to make. And and Sam's like, yeah, yeah, that's what we did. You know, Sam. (laughs) And um, so that's, of course, what the Cohen brothers did to raise funding for Blood Simple. Um, Yeah, there's this like really weird crossover that's happening in indie film right at this point where 
I guess it's just whether you care enough to actually lean into it and try, but like the Raimi, you know, the Raimi brothers are meeting the Cohen brothers. Meanwhile, like um, you can see the torn poster for the Hills have eyes in the basement in this Mm -hmm. one. So they were totally inspired, but what had been happening with um, Wes Craven did the Hills have it. Yeah. So they're totally inspired by like what Wes Craven is doing. Wes Craven, of course, had come out of like porn at this point but i mean talk about a guy who totally bootstrapped it um so it, it's a weird wacky world you're getting kind of coming out of the 70s and into the 80s of who's going to be doing these kind of hail mary indie things that are kind of genre specific and i think if you really watch blood simple you can watch blood simple as noir which is what it is but it's also very much a horror movie um the the whole last third of it essentially feels like a horror film um so you know there's like all these weird cross-cutting influences including i think a lot of the the stuff the coen brothers were doing in their first three or four films that was clearly them watching sam raimi's cool camera tricks and borrowing them until pretty much barry sonnenfeld's out of there and they bring in um deacons Mm mm-hmm so uh, Deacons is not putting a camera on a two by four and running through the woods with <laughs> it. So you get a different kind of filmmaking at that point. Yeah. And I know the Cohen, I mean, the Cohen's, I know Sam Raimi and their paths definitely cross quite a bit. There is, so I watched this probably like you did on it because they're all on HBO right now. Yeah. Um, I have, I almost put on, I have the, dvd which is the real aspect ratio Mm -hmm. um i mean it's i guess for hbo they chop off the top and bottom to do 16 by 9 um but it's either the disc for uh evil dead or evil dead 2 and it might be 2 where there's a lot of good audio commentary and these are all old old I mean, they're not Blu-rays, they're all DVDs, where they talk about Sam Raimi, the Coens, Holly Hunter, all essentially living in a house together, which must have been an interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> and I assume Francis McDormand was floating around at that point as well. Probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember oh, reading but, at one point, yeah. Jason Alexander had also been roommates with Holly Hunter at one point. Oh my people. goodness. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, but I know Sam Raimi shows up as a second unit on second unit director on the Hudsucker proxy. Well, I remember he and I think Ted Raimi are seen like in silhouette or something in Hudsucker proxy. Okay. Because there's a thing where they're trying to come up with a name for the hula hoop and they're like the, the whammo circle or something like that. <laughs> and the, the people behind in this, you just see in silhouette is I know one of them, Sam Raimi. And of course he's also in Miller's crossing for a hot second. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah. yeah. I don't know if any of these people talk to each other at all anymore. Um, it's, it's kind of incredible to know they're all still working and like, we're getting Macbeth, you know, out of, I guess Joel right now. And meanwhile, Sam Raimi's off going to collect his paycheck by doing, you know, Dr. Strange over here. Um, it's not something I probably would have predicted when I was sitting in the theater watching army of darkness the first time. Um, and, and certainly when you watch this, I can kind of, I kind of watching this, this time got me really excited, honestly, for Dr. Strange because there's so much of so much potential for horror elements. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would imagine. And, and when I remember watching Spider-Man two, when Dr. Octopus becomes Dr. Octopus and just being like, Oh my God, I can't believe such a Sam Raimi scene is in a major mainstream movie. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were, I mean, Michael and I, of course, were at the movie theater. We were just going nuts in those scenes. I mean, it, it's right out of Evil Dead 2 and a lot of Dark Man. I mean, just those furious camera moves. And 
points of view shots from everything. Raimi's really good at point of view shots. Um, I it kind of going back to Evil Dead, and I, I forget which character is in the basement, but I love. I think one of the scariest scenes for me is where you you see the creature in the basement point of view a lot as she's just like watching the people and Mm -hmm. all the comments about her eyes and what happened to her eyes. I don't know. That's those things really, I I thought that was really all very spooky and it goes to, I mean, I think Sam Raimi is also a really good writer in addition to being such a creative filmmaker. I mean, I, I think the guy has, even though he's not, you know, a household name, I don't think. But I, I mean, I think this this kind of time period of Sam Raimi and people like John Woo, just people who really took the camera off of the tripod and moved it so um, furiously yeah around their sets um i was kind of feeling like in probably talk about a little more with i think really army of darkness but it is funny that sam i I mean i think sam raimi has had such an influence on a lot of the pop culture that we have today i mean it's not like the guy invented quippy one-liners but their ash dna is all i mean i feel like ash dna is all throughout marvel especially oh i can see why you'd say that yeah 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 yeah. which i mean of course i mean you could i don't know how much this the current incarnation of marvel movies took from his spider-man stuff but i i don't know i i just I, I see a lot of that in, in these movies. So it is pretty interesting that he's back <laughs> into it doing, uh, doing Dr. Strange. Yeah. Um, I mean, talk about the, the, the camera movements. This is, you know, you'd also talked about like the POV stuff. Like it, it's this really interesting thing they do of, look, we can't afford, nor are we particularly interested in doing like flying demon shadow demons through the woods so we're going to do it from their POV. So you get that same knot in your stomach. You get a, a, a different knot almost mm-hmm. of where's it going? Oh my God. <laughs> it's going to go right through that window. And then, and, and completely. So it, everyone I watched, even this first one, I can't believe how much glass they smash. <laughs> um, but they going straight at the actors through the windows. It, it's a, I don't know if anyone really did that that way before him. Yeah. I, I certainly don't know either. I mean, it's um, yeah. It's so physical. I mm-hmm. mean, his filmmaking is really, really physical and there's almost a, you talk about the glass breaking. I mean, there's, there seems to be a disregard for physical things or not a disregard, but you would like you and I went to film school and I think there's a hesitancy when you're making a movie, not to destroy your set, (laughs) but, (laughs) but I mean, he, he goes for it and, and, I mean, he just makes the camera go in places that feel dangerous. Yeah. I mean, you you don't expect the camera to go through the glass. You know, you don't expect it to go through a bunch of thicket, maybe go over it, but he it's it really adds to I th- I think what is the uh, kind of a more visceral terror factor is of this one in that you, the camera never plays it safe. Right. So I think you get, or at least I got kind of off uh, balance as a viewer. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think so. It makes it feel like almost anything's possible mm-hmm. with with what's going on with the supernatural entities. Um, he does enough stuff to kind of set the mood outside the cabin with like, we got this shot that I love of the smoke coming over the moon or the clouds, you know, filling in over the moon. So, you know, that stuff's afoot and you see kind of whatever trick he does to make the ground burst open and kind of light come out. Um, And then after that, it's those camera moves uh, coming at people. And then even when, I think it's Cheryl. I think that's the character's name who runs off into the woods and has the, you know, infamous assault scene. Um, but the, the movement of the camera in that scene, no matter what you think of it is still remarkable. Um, it's, okay. it's, yeah. it's amazingly well done. And it was something I remember in doesn't film to trying to replicate basically that, but mix it with, the Superman three thing with the woman getting the wire across her face. (laughs) (laughs) It was like, we can do this. We can have this movement. This like crazy movement. I couldn't get the idea across to the guys I was working with. So um, it never, it never ended up working out very well. I wasn't willing to move the camera the way Sam Raimi is because I knew I'd be kicked out of college if I broke the camera. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's just so much, so much stuff like that. That's just, um, and, you know, you talk about disregard for the set. One of the things that, you know, the, the, the people working on the movie, Sam Raimi was the only person having a good time famously on this. Um, he went, when Bruce Campbell talks about in his book, it basically sounds like, Sam Raimi was like the more miserable everybody else was, the better time he was having. (laughs) And I mean, he was, you see what the makeup these people had to put on the contacts could only go in for 15 minutes at a time. Um, So they had to get the shots off quick. And of course they're in agony the whole time the contacts are in there. Um, And they had to have it because it was so focused on their eyes. What happened with their eyes? These people are all like, basically not making any money off making the movie and kind of like trapped in a cabin with him. And, and people basically started just leaving who were working on the film, uh, like kind of one after another. Um, I, I think he kept the cast mostly around, uh, but I think there were some shots that he shemmed um, because people <laughs> had kind of told him to go to hell at some point. Yeah. Um, but he, uh, yeah, it, it. I mean, the the actors go through no small amount of. You, it, one of the other things what, what I like about it is the demons throw punches. Like, what <laughs> other <laughs> franchise can you think of where when the people <laughs> become possessed, they turn around and cold clock somebody? It's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, 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 there's such a. Uh, uh, it. Uh, it all feels so not inspired by something else, which I think is is just so much. It's so refreshing to watch and talk about it being uh, the indie cinema ness of it is, I don't think I'd watch anything this low budget in a while. I mean, it might be like, Around every Christmas, I'll watch Blood Eat because that's one of my go-to Christmas movies. And I mean, that's certainly very low budget. Um, <laughs> but it, it, there's such a charm to like true low budget movies. I mean, yeah. like the clothes everybody wears in this had to have been either their own clothes or something that they could afford. The movie also feels very, I know he famously puts his Oldsmobile in mm. as much as he possibly can, but I, I think what also helps this movie is it, it never feels, it, I don't know. It's got this real magic quality of Sam Raimi camera movements that are completely unnatural and a very realistic looking and, 
feeling cast. I mean, they're not, they look like people, they look like real people in, in this movie. They don't look, I mean, they're not, I'm sure there was a makeup crew there, or maybe they're doing their own makeup. I think they're all doing their own stuff. Probably. Yeah. But it, it just, it feels, it, it's got a quality that even in a lot of today's indie films have a certain sheen and polish that isn't here. Yeah. Yeah, Which, I mean, it, it it looks like what it is. They got their friends together and, and made a film, but it doesn't have that, like, that one of the weird effects of having something like Amazon Prime, um, and, and now there's a ton of stuff on Amazon Prime that's like, we're going to we're gonna go make, I hate to pick on it because I actually enjoyed it, but like Velocipaster, um, where it's clearly a gag, right? Like yeah. we're, we're going to make a movie as a gag and it, we're not going to try and make it look great because we can't afford to, but that's going to be part of the gag. And this doesn't have that. And even those people always are clearly like actors with headshots. Yeah. And I don't believe I, anyone who made this movie had a headshot. Um, if they did, no, no. You know, they might've been in like the local playhouse or something like that. But, um, and, and I think it ends up feeling very natural because they're having really banal conversations. They don't, you know, there's not much in the way of like, let's get into Ash's backstory or anything like that. It's, that's my girlfriend. I'm going to give her something so I can have the setup plant payoff for later on in the film. I mean, that's about as much as you ever get. It's not even entirely clear with Scotty and the girl he's with if they're actually together or not. And he, in fact, refers to her as his friend later, not as his girlfriend, yeah. even though they were kind of getting naked earlier, you know, a couple of scenes before. Right. I mean, the eighties were a different time, kids <laughs> swinging free. Uh, yeah. I was very, I, I was trying to see what these actors had done, I guess, recently or after this and i've not seen it but i was very happy to see that i think almost everybody in this movie shows up in oz the great and powerful oh really yeah which i wonder if it was sam raimi's way of using a bunch of studio money to thank his friends later (laughs) i didn't dislike oz the great and powerful i didn't love the oz the great and powerful but um it was it was an interesting film in its way. I I need to see it at some point. I'm I've not seen that. I've not seen was it Crime Wave? Crime Waves? I've not seen first. Crime Wave. Yeah. 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 I finally just saw whatever it was, Maniac Cop, like last year with the uh, the Bruce Campbell film. Um, there's like these guys early stuff is not stuff I've seen a lot of a a whole ton of, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, so yeah, you, you, you have kind of this kind of wacky idea he's able to kind of build on, which, you know, we haven't even mentioned the fact there was a whole TV series that spun out of this and a remake, I guess, of evil dead, uh, that I guess was a much closer to this version than, evil dead too. Like they, they took it totally seriously. Yeah. I had, um, and there's a new one coming out. Oh, I hadn't heard that. I only saw that a couple of days ago. I think Ramey and Campbell are producers, um, evil dead rises or something like this, but I had avoided the remake for a very long time and eventually saw it. And, really liked it oh okay. shockingly shockingly yeah. liked it a lot but it, you're right it, it is definitely it's a it's a horror movie i mean it, it's it's much more in line with this this first one yeah which to me is kind of like okay well i guess i mean ash exists bruce campbell's still around i mean they can kind of do whatever they want maybe with the tv show they felt like they took it as far as they could take it i don't know yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it was a surprise to me that that's what they decided to do. 
Yeah, I, I, I never saw any of the series. I, I will be candid. I watched the first half of it, and it just wasn't very good. Ah, yeah. So I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, as much as I it, love and adore these movies, in somewhere in this house, um, Michael Corley gave me a nice framed uh, Army of Darkness poster. Mm-hmm. He hunted one down from when we worked at the movie theater because clearly the their I mean it was released theatrically, but there was not a huge advertising budget for this. So I think he had to track down one of the posters around town. I don't even know if we got one at our theater. I mean, we showed the movie. Uh-huh. Um, but that's I, I love these movies. Never saw the TV series and. I don't know. It never, I guess I like them in, in film form rather than. Yeah. It, it, we can talk about it kind of as we wrap up. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I remember about it. I think as we, as we get into the third episode on, on all this, but, um, but yeah, I, I just, if you've, if you've only really familiar with evil dead Two and army of darkness, I, I, I can't imagine that you haven't seen this one. Um, but it's really interesting to see what's possible on such a low budget. If you really think about what you want to do kind of ahead of time, it, to some extent, but part of the problem apparently for the, the cast and crew was that Raimi was also being super creative and kind of, like he'd think of something, you know, the day before and suddenly the shot got five times more complicated and everybody was going to be in way more physical agony while he was doing whatever (laughs) he was doing. Um, And so it, it became, you know, and you can kind of see, I said at the beginning, like you can see it kind of evolving almost into evil dead Two by the third part of the film when you really do hit that like hyper gory part of it and ash is just completely covered in gook and slime and blood and, and everything else um, where you can tell like this was taking a toll on everybody. It's they were doing it. Uh, I mean, you have to, some of these actors had to have been on the floor for scenes for days because people are either being taken out while they're still mortal or when they're getting possessed, he's like knocking them out temporarily before they leap up again or whatever, <laughs> but they're still in the room. Cause they're only, you know, like in, there's only like three rooms in the whole film. Um, but yeah, like you start to see the camera do all these Dutch angles where it's like tilting up and you can see the ceiling, which I'm not sure they ever intended to show. Um, you, you can see them um, doing uh just like a lot more, we're going to just keep pouring stuff onto people. And, and uh, the, the, I can't imagine how long some of the effect shots at the end took to do between the stop motion um, and, and the, the various blood effects and, and pus and stuff that were coming out of people. (laughs) So. Yeah. In the, in just the sheer amount of blood. I mean, when he's, when he's down in the basement and, it's like the pipe breaks and it's mm-hmm. just, I don't know how many gallons of blood they had to haul <laughs> out there to, <laughs> to make, to make that work. Um, yeah. Yeah. I kind of wondered if the, the puddle of blood in the basement with the band aid box, which is a great touch floating in it. Um, if that was left over from like, well, we've shot all this, like, Oh my God, it's all collected here. Like we've got to put that in the movie. Or, <laughs> yeah. You know. um, yeah. I, it, it, something that I was thinking about in, in this movie. And it, I, I certainly don't have an answer is when, when, what makes bad, bad and bad good as far as filmmaking goes? Um, because I mean, this, this thing is low budget. I think a couple of the actors were actual actors. I think the guy who played Scott or Scotty was a real 
not real actors. They're all, they all do fine jobs. But um, I think I read somewhere where he had to change his name for the, for some iterations of the film, because it was not a union production. So he couldn't oh, okay. use, um, but I mean, comparing, I, I thought a lot about um, this film and I mentioned it before blood beat. And there's another movie that it kind of reminded me of that came, I think must've been years later, maybe more closer to evil dead Two, called demon wind that is a hoot it is an absolute hoot um that are you know they're kind of not i don't know i mean they're not they're not polished but like this movie totally works Mm -hmm. and i can see where and i think people have fun with movies like blood beat. And if you've seen, you've seen blood beat, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah. I can't recommend it enough, frankly. <laughs> like I, I really enjoy that movie, but it's also very, it, it's got to probably have a similar budget to this. Yeah. I mean, it's, Maybe I, lower, I think I looked yeah. up, I think they're made, you know, within a couple of years. Yeah. Of, of each other, but it, it's, it's curious when a movie transcends the budget and maybe the skill level of some of the people involved uh, to, to, I guess, kind of rise above, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I think that's a, a, a whether you're talking about like college film or you're talking about, indie film or you're talking about um, you know, like a big polished studio film. I think like when I think about Bloodbeat in particular, um, they had big ideas that were kind of abstracted, but then they became very talky about all of it. Yeah. And I think that's often where indie film, like it's cheap to be talky, but that's the hardest thing to actually pull off. Like the script isn't tight enough. The acting isn't quite there in how you both capture the audio, like your sound recorder. Um, and you're the, I think usually the pacing when you're doing those things can have a massive, massive impact. And I think Ramey either by either on purpose or by accident, like I said, they just don't talk in this movie. Um, they, have their little chit chat in the car that feels very much like late seventies, like low budget movie chit chat, like, Oh, you're a goof. You're a goof. You know, that kind of stuff. And, but you get past all that, like the minute that they get to the cabin and then it's like, they're talking, but what they say doesn't really matter except for what's on that tape recorder. And they're apparently hired this, highfalutin actor to get (laughs) like real audio for that because I knew how important it was. Um, And it's the best audio in the whole movie by far. Yeah, it, it, it really is. I, I I had a note about the dubbing in the film and I mean, his, his like, oops, his creature sound design is really good and pretty unnerving. And I think, help helps a lot but yeah you're right um and there's also such a i mean for me there's a real charm to imperfection Mm -hmm. in in movies like this I, i i don't disagree i mean i think it's i think the the danger of it is i think people decide oh i see these quirks in my own filmmaking in my imperfections. And so I've decided that's charming. It's not up to you as the filmmaker to decide that (laughs) your thing is to make the best movie possible. And if there's rough edges, there's going to be rough edges. Um, And I, 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 I think that that's where some people end up falling apart with their, indie movies that and just too much today. I, what was the name of that crappy movie? We watched slither, not slither. So there's a halfway okay movie. It was like super cheap. It was like a 
late seventies movie about like something had come out of the bay because they'd put pollution in there. Oh, um, um, I saw it recently. Yeah, it was like free on Amazon Prime like for the past two years, and I can't remember the name of it. Right now. Yes, it is. I really like this director. Who um, let me find it? Because Michael and I, when we would go through the blockbuster, we would. Um, uh, I'm trying to find it here. We would always see the cover. And the tagline, if I'm thinking of the movie you're thinking of, it is the tagline of the film is they're men, but their skin has been turned inside out. And that is not at all the film. (laughs) Oh, I didn't see the tagline. So, but that's not at all the movie I saw. (laughs) Right, right. We were. um... Yeah, I'm, I'm now I'm looking that up. That's the Island of the Fishmen. Yes, but okay, this is a different um, movie. You're thinking of a different movie? I am thinking of a different movie. I suspect that there are plenty oh, of films about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm never going to find it cuz the na- the name of it's like absolute nonsense. <laughs> um but I mean, it's another movie where basically it was like, it's really a monster movie, but they don't have any budget. So it's people standing around talking a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And it, it ends up being like not quirky or cute or any of that. It's, it's just bad. Um, entertaining in its own way, but mostly if you're talking over it. So. I'm going to be very obsessed with the, um, because I know this this Island of the Fishmen movie. I know it by a different uh, name. Huh. Well, it's it's not very it's it's, it's good bad. <laughs> Whatever that term is. Um, I'd say I did it. I know I did it as a watch party, but I did it like two years ago, like at the beginning of COVID. So I can begin to like go through my blog and figure out like what the hell it was. Um, yeah, no, I can't find it. Oh God. We did a lot of terrible movies as watch parties. I'll tell you that much. I just came across when we did. Thank God it's Friday. Um, Anyway, I, I it I don't really know what happened between this movie and Evil Dead Two. I, I'll do some reading before we get to that. How they actually secured the funding for that? This one, they ended up doing like the whole like roadshow thing with of of um, you know they showed it in Detroit when they'd finished cutting it. It did like way beyond expectations, and so. Uh, one of the guys, Ramy, was kind of tied up with with like legal advice and money. Was like was involved with Can and brought it to Can, uh, which is for all of us thinking of Can as being like the Palme d'Or. It's really an international film market, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's always what I think of when I think of like who who made this and who is it for. There's like all kinds of like weird skeezy people there buying up movies to redistribute in their home countries uh and getting getting the, the rights to them um this movie i they if you look at like wikipedia they have no idea basically how much it actually made overseas like no one's actually talking it's they say it's somewhere between 3 million and 30 million <laughs> that is a wide wide range it only costs like 350 375 to make uh the marketing was pretty much non-existent for it um and in the u.s i think it also ended up making something like three million on top of that and that was just in its initial release i'm sure every time it comes out on dvd it's making another three million for them oh uh, yeah yeah i imagine i'm i'm a little surprised that i have yet to update what i have to to blu-rays I recently bought all three of them in a row. I got probably at the beginning of COVID. 
um, I because I was watching them and I didn't have HBO Max. I think HBO Max has come out during COVID, right? Yeah, so it was it was so. pre, yeah. Um, but I also want just wanted to make sure I had them. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that's about all I've got on Evil Dead. And do you have any other thing you wanted to make sure you hit? Uh, no. I'm just looking at my notes. I just like how relentless the movie is. I mean, it, it's so loud. It's got a really good score. Um, I really like that they don't give the viewer a break when things go bad. I mean, Raimi, I think, has this um, cadence that he does a lot of having like a boom and then a pause and then it goes really crazy. Yeah. Um, and it, it's certainly this kind of like one, two, three that he's used. I mean, throughout, like, uh, I'm sure it's all over that Dr. Octopus scene <laughs> um, <laughs> in Spider Man, too. But I, I, I really I appreciate how much this movie puts me kind of like ill at ease and on edge, even though. I mean, you could say that some of the effects are not great because you can see like if a hand is covered in latex to look like a demon hand, you can easily see where the latex ends and the person's hand begins. You know what? Begins. That actually, when I was watching it this time, worked better for me than all the CGI makeup on a hand in the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's why I put down my sandwich. Like, I was like, this is disgusting. (laughs) This is really one of the movies. I know people like to get on the whole practical effects are the best. CGI is terrible, which there's varying degrees in there. But this is the kind of movie where if if this were not real, then it wouldn't work. I mean, and if they made this movie today, unless they were really trying... I don't feel like it would be as practical as it is. And it, I mean, it really goes to Raimi's credit for just knowing how everything needed it, whether he really knew how everything needed to work together or not, or whether this was just a bit of luck and the miracle. But it's but, too, it's, it's too much though, it, for it to have been all luck and like, yeah. I think about like when, when the possessed, I guess Cheryl is down in the basement and I didn't have not even talked about like how brilliant it is to have the trap door of her like banging, like, and, and like taunting them and and, like screaming, like she's always in the room when he's going through everything. Um, But then also showing like, okay, our makeup doesn't look great. So let's put it into half light. Like that was brilliant. It's, it, you can tell how absolutely screwed up looking she is at that point oh, and mm-hmm. why everyone has been like becoming more and more horrified every time her head pops up out of the trap door. Um, and then there's a, it's because of the timing on it. They do that mirror that also then turns into a pool of water that Ash puts yeah. his hand through. Mm-hmm. Like it's not the best effect, but if you're not paying attention and this time I wasn't, and it's like, and then of course, after I watched it, I'm like, oh yeah, 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 that's the reflection off the black at the. Okay, I know how they did that, but in the second it happens, it's freaking brilliant. Um, yes. And then there's all the reverse shot from the inside of a clock. Like, who thought of that? <laughs> like, that's insane. <laughs> it's yeah. absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah, I mean, there's no. I mean, you you know as well as I do when you're making a movie, there is a point where you really just have to get the shot so you have the shot. Yeah. It, it, I don't feel that at all through this movie. I mean, every shot that's there needs to be there and is done 
100%. I mean, it, I'm guessing this is in part what made the crew it was. in cast. Yeah. So wanting to get the hell out of there. But there's just so many, like, when I watched it the first time for this, where Ash and, again, I forget her name, when they're trying to leave and they come across the bridge and the, you know, the, it's the hand that's that's back. I couldn't figure out, like, why is this shot so weird? Um, but then I read that they had to park the car on an angle. So the car is on an incline and they tilted the camera. Oh. So the car would look like it was parked flat. So that's why everybody's head at an angle. is at such yeah. a weird angle. And... Um, One second. You can come in. Tanya. (laughs) (laughs) Tanya, everybody. (laughs) I texted. um, I ran out of my beverage. Thank you very much. Uh, A little bit ago. So I was trying to slyly text her to uh, bring me another bourbon. Oh man, and, that's <laughs> and she was very graciously trying not to uh interrupt uh our recording, but at this point, no one cares. They, they're already <laughs> in, they've been in with us this long. Yeah. But yes, I mean the, the this movie and Sam Raimi in general is so creative that maybe that's what really carries this movie, despite bad hair bad clothes despite its minuses and they're not really even minuses, but um, it, it's so over the top creative and it never relinquishes what it's trying to do. Yeah. And I, I, that is very much, I think you hit the nail on the head with like why the crew is going crazy. And I, I think at the end, they all understood what, Ramey had actually pulled off um, and everyone made a buck off of it. So I think everyone was pretty happy at the end, but, and, and, you know, to this day that cast is um, still shows up for horror cons and, you know, things like that. So they're continuing to enjoy like, ah, yeah, I was in this crazy movie, you know, 40 years ago. Um, (laughs) And I I think the women who were in evil dead Two similar, uh, also still do cons and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's the creativity that's there right out of the gate. Um, I mean, obviously it all worked out for Sam Raimi very, very mm-hmm. well. And, and to see then something like a simple plan where none of that is in the film, but it's still so damn good. The guy's just a genius. The guy's just really, oh, yeah. really smart. Yeah, um, he, 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 yeah. I need to see the Kevin Costner movie. The baseball, which is one? a major the baseball no. one. The baseball no? one. Yeah. 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 Okay. I suddenly was like, was that the was that the baseball movie? I couldn't remember <laughs> at all because I've never seen it either. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thank you so yeah. much for doing this, and we'll be back relatively soon to do Evil Dead Two, and then into Army of Darkness. Uh, do stay with us. And um, we'll be back soon with not Army of Darkness. I don't know what I I don't know what's happening the next. Oh, I do know what's happening the next week, and it's it's going to be a big surprise, kids. So, (laughs) anyway, Justin, thank you so much. Thank you. It was good to be back. It is good to be back. It's great to have you back. Thank you. (laughs) Bye, everybody. (laughs) Goodbye.
that about wraps it up for this edition of The Signal Watch, a production of the League of Melbotus. Thanks for sticking with us. If you enjoyed the podcast, we invite you to drop on by the Signal Watch blog, where you'll find write-ups of a wide variety of movies and more. We'd love to hear from you, so find us online and let us know what you think. Whether you prefer email, blog comments, or social media, we'll be happy to hear from you. We'll be back soon with more exceedingly high-quality content. So, until next time. God damn it, babies. You've got to be kind.